Hello and welcome to today's show on our game. Michael Verney in the hot seat today. Shane Stapleton is getting ready for championship. Uh, I think he's away doing a, pre- a pre-season uh, training camp somewhere exotic. But delighted to be joined by Damien Lawler from RT Sport. Damien, how are you? Morning, Mick. I don't think um I don't think Shane did a pre-season even when he was hurling. To be honest with you. No, probably not. I'm sure he's somewhere working on his tan at this very moment in time, though. Um, oh, Damien, just even from, from your perspective, working with RT in that, uh, mm. I'd say it's an exciting time, the more than an exciting time for myself and anyone working in GA at the moment. It's It's been busy the last couple of months, but it's about to get a hell of a lot busier, and it's an exciting time. A busy time, but an exciting time. Yeah, you put the finger on it there, Mick, to be honest with you. Like, I don't know how long I'm in this business now, but I'm in it a long, long time. And you always got that that buzz around the championship. And I suppose back when it did start out, like you had an unbelievable gap between the league and the championship. And you had a serious run in to where I grew up, we'll say, in Munster Hurling Championship. And you don't have that anymore. And the, kind of the one thing I'm picking up there, uh, you know, yesterday and today is we can't get to celebrate this or this is part. We're looking ahead to Sunday straight away. And it just goes to show you that the the, the turnaround times are just non-existent now. It's uh, in in order to give the the club the club scene probably room to breed, Mick. Uh, we've had to go maybe with a 37, 38 week intercounty season. Um, and I, I think that in my own head anyway, we're probably maybe a week or two off the perfect juncture whereby yeah. you, you get two weeks to enjoy your league title victory. Um, otherwise, Mick, people are going to look at the leagues and say, hang on a second now. So I do believe this season coming, it retrospectively would be crucial for next year's leagues to see what teams take out of it, particularly in football. When you, you have to go for the league, maybe maintain your Sam Maguire status, you have to do yourself justice in the provincial championship and yet peak for the round robin series after that. So there's there's a lot to tell just yet. But to answer your question, even today, like it's actually nice out there and there's a there's a bit of a buzz in, in the weather as well. And mm. I know it's still very early to be starting championship, but there's nothing like it. This is definitely the best time of the year. The, the anticipation every county is something to build for. I should have said at the outset today's show brought to you by orgoretro.com. I'm do- I'm donning this jersey because we had a good win yesterday. Um <laughs> now we had a good win over Kildare and I know yeah. you're uh, you're living in Kildare now. Um it's a bit of a kind of a we'll go into it a bit more in a minute, but it's a difficult one with the le- with the leagues as well in hurling for the likes of it. You know, if Kildare had come up going into division one, you are mm. really been thrown into the you've been thrown into the deep end. The more than Offaly will be, the more than Westmead were yeah. this year. Offaly were a couple of years ago. Uh, it's a difficult one, but you were you were at the game uh, like a real tale of two halves, Damien Ball account. Yeah. You finished Offaly twenty four points, Kildare one eighteen. But Kildare were not in control at half time, but probably should have been further ahead at half time. They should have had, Mick. And I suppose to answer your first question, really, there's a massive step up now between the likes of Kildare, Offaly, and even a Westmead or a Leash. There's no point to say, in other words, the gulf is is huge. But I was looking at the, the promotion of, of Kildare hurling during the week. You know, not so much Offaly, Mick, because, you know, you're, you have a tradition down there and it's more traditional. And even the Offaly crowd wouldn't have been as big as the Kildare crowd yesterday. And mm. even though going to Division 1, you probably would get your ass handed to you on quite a few occasions. I still think from a an optics point of view or a marketing point of view or or a, a progressive point of view would have been huge for Kildare to get up there, to get up to that level, to have a Division One status beside her name and to fundamentally improve the work that's been going on. Like, I'm probably here 10, 10 plus years. Uh, just I can see the ground level my kids are playing. Um, the, the passion up here for Hurling is, is massive now, massive. And it would have been lovely for the county to, to get up to that level and just see what it was all about. Uh, they'll find it hard next year with the likes of Leash coming back down. But uh, in terms of conditioning and SNC and all that, that'll be a gap straight away. But to go to yesterday's game, 
Offaly were deserved winners. Um, they weren't spectacular by any means. It took them a while to get into the game. They had a defensive probably masterclass in that after four, 14 or 15 minutes, uh, the likes of Samson, uh, Keneally, you know, all these guys crowded out to kill their half-forward midfielders. And they started winning more breaking ball there and they got a foothold in the game. Now, they didn't play anything like the, the running game that Kildare played, Mick. They, they went direct uh, more often than not to a two-man full forward line. They pulled a lot of people back. But Kildare pulled back as well, but they like to run through the lines. That let them down just a little bit at times during the game. If you're looking from a Kildare point of view, what cost them? They definitely had a few wides in the first half. It absolutely killed them. They were under pressure from the off defence while they shot. Probably should have a bit more composure. And then, uh, I suppose, they missed a few frees in the second half as well. And a lot of the scores that Offaly got in the first half were from turnovers as well. So if I was yeah. Johnny Kelly, I'd be very, very happy with that. From an Offaly point of view, there's still another gear to find, for sure. Uh, I'm not sure if there's two years to find, but there's still another one. Johnny was very concerned about the makeup of the half forward line and the full forward line yesterday. He spent an awful lot of time trying to direct the traffic there in terms of how they go out on the on their own puck out, how they react to the Killer puck out. Effectively, he wanted more work rate out of them in, in that area. Th that eventually came in the second half. There was only one team in it, but yet near the end. Uh, Kildare had a heap of missed chances again, Mick, and yeah. probably had a chance to draw it with Paddy McKenna's shot, which Stephen Corcoran saves. And, and then he uh, belted it out over the terrace. <laughs> he did. I, 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 I definitely saw him going into the balcony of one of the, the, the apartments in, beside O'Moore Park. So I'd say somebody was having a cup of tea and a sandwich, and uh, an angry Corcoran sitter came in on the I side. I wouldn't anyway. mind uh, Brian Stapleton that used to play with Leach, <laughs> used to live in those apartments, and you'd always see when any big game was in a more park to be deck chair sitting out, it was usually during the summer and they'd all just be watching. But he might, he might have got a brand new, uh, a brand new O'Neill's uh, peeled into his window, maybe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, well, well, in, in terms of doing... Yeah, go on, yeah. It, it, in terms of doing an overview in a game, there's no better place than the apartments in Humber Park anyway. They're, you're looking right down on the yeah. action. You can see the structures and the shape very, very well. I actually got up into the bird's nest in Nolan Park recently for the Leinster College's final. And it is amazing what you see when you're really high up. And that's why a lot of uh, yeah. statisticians, coaches, managers even want to see yeah. the behind the goal kind of angle now because you can see yeah. so much more. It's well, amazing. well just to pick up on that, Mick, like, so I gave most of my professional career up in level seven in Crow Park or the old press box in Crow Park. And, you know, you know yourself, the, the view is is absolutely spectacular. I mean, even if you didn't know a huge amount about the games, I think you'd be able to see what way teams are setting up, where the runners are coming from, the shape and the structure. Um, wh where I am with, with RT at the moment on the sideline. You don't get anything like that vantage point. What you, what you do get is the body language. You actually hear, yeah. the, the, you hear the exchanges between... The player, manager, opposing managers, uh, usually the fourth official gets an whack of it as well. Uh, but you can't, like you couldn't even see the far side of the pitch in terms of reading what's happening on the far wing, for example, Mick. So that elevated view, I am amazed. I suppose there's a traditional thing in the GEA whereby an inter-county manager feels the need to be given, the, give, you know, given heat or given a presence to his players on the sideline. But I am amazed that more and more coaches, particularly maybe the younger coaches, are not taking that elevated view um, and going up there. And I suppose you've seen a few managers. Jack O'Connor would often go up and come back down. Peter Keane, you know, they used to do all that. You definitely get a much better, particularly in the opening 10 minutes of a game or the opening 10 of a second half, just to see what you're facing. There, there's nothing like the vantage. Like, you can't really see on the sideline is what I'm trying to say to you. It's too far yeah. of a reach to, to get to the projected to the far wing. It's a funny one. You, uh, it depends on your managerial approach as well. If you are kind of blood and thunder, lean sheedy style, you want to be there and yeah. you want your energy to nearly, you know, transfer into your players. It's a wonder Jim Gavin didn't do it actually because he was so cool and calculated and he wasn't offering them anything from the sideline really. Do you know what I mean? Like he was quite calm, but it's amazing. It's, it's, like, yeah, the rugby do it. Like the rugby do it the whole time. They do. Now, it's a bit claustrophobic for me with the rugby. Like You couldn't even swing like that in a box. But I think with Gavin, maybe, I fully agree with you. I, I looked over at him a good few times, and you're talking about usually against Mayo. You're going into the melting pot of the last three minutes of an All-Ireland final, and it's up for grabs, and it's helter-skelter. And with all the bad luck Mayo got in finals over the years, you know, any neutral would be kind of saying, geez, they're going to get a rub of the green eventually. Like, you know, they're conceding own goals and, 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 and stuff like that. But Jim Gavin was constantly there like that. And I wonder, was his presence in such a calm demeanour, was that maybe the fill-up that the Dublin players needed? Whereas maybe with the likes of Davy Fitz or Ashidi, 
the players maybe come get off the thunder almost. I, I'm not sure, yeah. but yeah, you're right. He would have been a candidate to go up. And I, he always argued anyway that his job was done and he didn't need to be shouting at the players. But look, he's he's in the minority in the GEA terms there, I think. <laughs> it, has, it has been to have the players as well. Uh, just a couple of comments in there. Uh, Tom O'Keen, Verney Offaly uh, win Kildare. Mead Hurland is in a great position on beating yet. The good yeah. win at the weekend. Just a good question. I might just I'll fire this to you first, Damo, and then I'll have a go at it myself. Detox uh, 101. Any direct feedback from teams that play Division 1 and were hammered every game? Anyone saying they would have been better staying in Division 2 uh, and have frequent success? Any drop off in players in those teams? Anecdotally, Damo, would you have been chatting many different lads maybe that would have played down there and what would yeah. the thoughts have been on it? Yeah, well, my thoughts are very, very simple on it. A lot of the players who maybe even want to... Look, there's a couple of key players missing for both sides this year. I mean, like, you know, like the likes of Oshin from, from Offaly and that, but like Jack Sheridan from Kildare as well. No, I think my, my feedback over the years is that a lot of players would go travelling maybe and maybe regret the fact then that they're not around for a tilt at Division 1. After all, like, that's what you... If you're if you're 12 years of age, 13 years of age, and you're hurling in a Kildare, um, I won't say awfully, because if you're that age, maybe, you know, awfully Worley McCarthy back then, but you you have to aspire to get up there. Mm. Um, the problem for me, Mick, is I've seen... You know, your, your texture is right. I've seen so many teams over my years go up to a level. Um, and, and more recently, what Cheddar did with Leash, but Bonner and Carlo before that, Brian Hanley and West Meath, um, you know, I saw Westmead nearly push Galway very, very close in the championship. Right. I've seen all that. But slowly, there's been a regression back down. Now, probably not so much in Westmead's case. that They've really probably held firm. But were they ever as good as they could have been? I don't think so. And there's a reason. You need central backing at this stage, Mick. I, I'm always banging this drum. The work is going in on the ground. Um, it's complicated. In a lot of these cases, hurling is not the first sport in the county. Uh, you have to get funding. You have to get your academy structure right. You have to make sure that you're you're really going well. This sounds naive, but at under 12, 13, 14, 15, but 16. But it's your next generation. That, that, is, that is your next generation. It's your next generation. Like, yeah, yeah. And, and they have to be in the forest still. They have to be in the Arabon. They have to be competing in Fela B, Fela A. They, you know, I, I see my young lad goes around, he, he hurls with Nace under 12s. They, they would play hurling and football anywhere in the country to get a game and to get a good game. And I think the point is, there's a huge amount of work being done on the ground. However, so few hurling counties out there capable of competing at the top level. And even the gap between Limerick and the rest is enormous at the moment. And you, you do need more help, Mick, in terms of increased investment. That investment needs to be sustained for a five or seven year project from Crow Park. You should be held accountable. You should be hit. You should be given measurements to hit. And if you don't hit them, then the funding stops. But if you're able to get participation numbers up, if you're able to increase the number of clubs hurling in the county, if you're able to have a presence of coaches in the school, if you're able to show that the work has been done on the ground, I think the very least you deserve is a, is a, an isolated look from Crow Park to say, hang on now, we have a Kildare or a Meath who are capable in seven years of being a Dublin. You know, let's try and push the bars up here and let's try and get the, the structures going better domestically. And that hasn't happened really. The Leinster Council uh, mostly have, have, you know, have, have looked at projects. They've looked at designated groups. They've looked at increased funding, but they, they need more than Leinster Council help make. My answer to your texter is there needs to be a kind of a significant investment for a sustained period for a county to try and get up to Division 1 and keep it there. You know, and you're talking schools, you're talking GDAs, you're talking increased resources, um, you're, you're talking maybe spreading the gospel at underage. I see in Kildare here, there's, there's clubs trying to get hurling off the ground and they're not finding it easy. And they need help in this. And they need equipment as well. So I don't know what's going to happen here with those counties, Mick, but until that happens, you're going to see the yo-yo effect, I think. you know, Different with Dublin. They had a, a CEO who was able to strategize the whole way through, they got big, big money from from the from the GEA as well over the years. Let's be honest about it, and they have a massive population. You know, other counties don't have have any of that really. Yeah, and hurling has been made sustainable in Dublin as a result of that. Um, now I would have been chatting to a few of the Offaly lads down through the years, and they love getting a crack off Division One teams. They don't think about the idea of being beaten by fifteen or twenty points, or they don't think of cumulative cumulative negative score difference after. They just like I remember Cork played Offaly in the league in Borough last year, and the lads just couldn't wait for a crack off. And it was the same <coughs> when they played Limerick. And you need to be uh, exposed to the standard. Now I will say this: I think the old Division 1A and Division 1B, mm -hmm. where, like, 
Westmead were shown in with, you know, five really big hitters this year. Probably teams ranked yeah. one, three, four. Do you know what I mean? Whereas if you're playing teams ranked eight, nine, ten, eleven, if Offaly are in Division One next year, which they are, and they're playing Westmead, Antrim, Wexford, Dublin, like mm. you know, you fancy your chances of getting results in those games, and you you're not going to be hammered. And if you're able to earn your place in Division 1 against the real big hitters, then so be it. Then you've earned your place. But I think those sort of games would serve awfully an awful lot better. But players don't really think about it like that. And no. they love they love getting a crack off the off the big hitters. There's no point in saying anything. No, they do. And they want to test themselves against the pace. They want to test themselves against the intensity. Like, they're unbelievably hard work themselves. But yeah, you, you're right, Mick. There's a... There's a, a graduated tier to 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 maybe nav- navigate when you get up to Division One, and like it should it should be a little bit more accessible for these counties. Whereby the counties you've named, they may have psychologically even going into the game, they, they might have a different outlook on it altogether. And like people were saying to me yesterday, oh, if Kildare go up, they'll get absolutely trounced. And I was I'm scratching my head saying, why would you get out of bed in the morning? Like if that's your outlook, you know, you, you have to get up there and test yourself. And from a from a promotional point of view what it would do for the game is, is is sensational, you know? And, like, don't get me wrong, Mick, I was going down to that game, like, uh, you know, obviously from Killer One, and, like, you know... You hate, listen, should... Demo, you hate Offaly, and you're a Killer <laughs> that's, the way, that's the way it is. You were going down no, to that game, <laughs> you were going down to that game with, with ill will in your mind. See, that's the poison you have in your hearts, and uh, I, I tried to preach the love. And what I'm trying to say to you is, I'm only one parish over from Shinron, and like you would have seen the likes of Diggy Cordial and that over the years, and the kind of freestyle hurling he had. To be honest with you, even the Offaly jersey, traditionally, I would have grown up and when I was a kid, Offaly were winning, like, and they were a team you'd all as admire. What I'm trying to say to you, without patronizing anybody, hurling needs Offaly right back up there, you know, right back up there. You're too much crack for anybody to hate as well. Like, so. <laughs> <laughs> but but that's what I'm saying. Like both teams probably deserve a shot. Like your work has been gradual, and now now I believe there's still more work to be done too. Even at under fourteen level, it has to it has to be sustained. And your minor team was good last year, Mick. But like, will the work continue on again this year? I was involved with, a small bit with Nay CBS this year, and we played against Skull Cormac, and uh, Skull Cormac better in the semi final of the B. Obviously, did very well in the colleges A as well. But I was impressed. Obviously, you look at Screeny and, but, but, you know, he's shooting the lights out. And we tried very, very hard to, to watch him that night. He's free taking and his ability to find scores. But you need three or four Screenies coming up every yeah. two or three years, you know. And, and that's the, the, that will only come at underage level. But the one thing I will say about Skull Cormac and the one thing I'll say about Offaly is the absolute compact shape that they had and the squeeze that they put on the opponents. Um, and the, the probably stranglehold they had over the middle third. That was common to both teams, so I don't know if it's an awfully platform going forward, but certainly one that works while you regain your foothold in the game. Yeah, Screeny and Cole were actually playing for the 20s at the weekend. Yeah. They beat Westmead, I think it was 222 to 117. The minors and Cal came on for the seniors as well, yeah. Uh, After playing under 20, Michael Cal, Charlie, Charlie Mitchell. Charlie, Charlie Mitchell. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Charlie Mitchell, Let's sorry, go. yeah, yeah bigger part. A good player too, but awfully probably need to stay up in Division 1 a couple of years to get the likes of. Uh, well, I don't know when Adam Screen will be seeing the senior jersey because he probably has a fair bit of he's a fair Fitting bit of work up. to do. But the yeah. likes of James James Mahan, Breck and Cavanagh, and a few more who are maybe a bit physically more imposing, the likes of Dan Ravenhill as well. But they, yeah, it's going to take a while to to get them through. And just on your point, uh, Damo, mm. as well, that was an exceptional group of minors. But yeah, there's yeah. there's there's probably nothing like that group coming at the moment, if you get me. And so I you believe, need, yeah. You need, you need really competitive teams every year. You need to be bringing through three or four every year, realistically. Um, Just to yeah. move away for, from hurling a small bit, Demo, just L- Larry McCarthy made some interesting comments yesterday. Um, In mm. my opinion, I would say he's been a, a relatively quiet president. I don't think he's said too much, but he's obviously, Charlotte Burns is going to take over from, from him next year uh, when Congress runs around early in the year. But uh, it was an eventful enough afternoon for him yesterday. So, <laughs> He he um he basically was looking for a, a round of applause for Liam Devaney, the referee in Division Two final, and there was some booze emanating from what seemed like Hill Six Hill Sixteen, mm. and he, he <laughs> said, uh, "Now, now, gentlemen," um, and I think James McCarthy. Um, praised the referee as well and I think there was booze emanating from around there again and then after the Division 1 final when he was handing the trophy to 
Pat, uh, Paddy Dirk and he just says we now turn to the next phase of the inter-county season as we do let me remind people and members of the critics collective in particular that what we say matters what we write matters in the next few months our critiques should be tempered by the fact that those involved in the championship are uh, are their volunteers and their members of our association and their amateurs recent criticism of our ethos has been unhelpful and critiques should never degenerate into personal attacks I was a bit lost by this. I have to mm. say, um, are you are you aware of exactly what he's kind of maybe referring to? Is it that Kushtabanish D decision, maybe where <laughs> your teams aren't allowed to have anything to do with charities under jerseys or anything like that? Or what do you think it might be? Um, I wouldn't say it's an obvious one straight away. Like it's certainly not totally clear what way Larry's comments were going, Mick. But from the moment he came in as president, uh, the referees thing was probably number one. Um, you know, on on his on his agenda, the club thing as well uh, was probably very very high up there. And if you look at his his. Uh, like Larry would go to the fitness test for refereeing in Abbottstown. He'd probably go twice a year or three times a year at, at the very, very least. And if you look at his tweets, he probably visited most club grounds in Ireland at this stage as well. He has been quiet, but behind the scenes, I guess, I suppose, he's probably been out and about maybe at ground level. But I think Jarlis will be a lot more vocal, uh, probably is even already, uh, in terms of speaking his mind and stuff. I just wonder, is it going back to the constant maybe narrative that uh, maybe the administration at one level is maybe a bit removed from the, the, the administration or the association at ground level. Yeah. And I wonder, is it is it feeding into that, um, the fact that Larry would have been very, very strong on giving the club player, um, you know, a, a good split season, a, a good platform for them to, to, to thrive in later in the year, uh, probably comes uh, as a result of a, probably comes then a consequence of that is a, a condensed inter-county season and they've been getting a lot of flack for that they've been getting a lot of flack for the charity thing as well um and i think they wanted maybe to, to clean up that i think uh, a lot of the causes are, are obviously very very genuine most of the causes are but I, I i i'm not so sure it got a lot of negative attention certainly over the weekend Mick. and you know that probably could have been fresh in his mind but i think too Social media criticisms of players are a no-no in his book, and he's brought that up on several occasions. Now, what can he do to stop it? Very, very little, but he has been putting out the message here time and time again that the GEA will not tolerate uh, social media criticism of their players, that it's, it's, it's not right, um, that these guys are amateurs, and I think that's another one. So between the social media abuse, between the, the respect for referees, and he's always mentioning that whenever he gets a chance, and I'd say maybe alluding to the criticism of the perceived gulf that's there between top and bottom. I'd say there are three things that were in his mind and maybe the fresh criticism over the decision with the charities, um, maybe that that stuck in his craw a little bit as well, Mick. But I just wonder maybe if he's going to say something, should he have just been clear about it and maybe just given us a, a direct target for his criticisms or his thoughts, you know? Yeah, what was the, the phrase he used again? The the critics uh the what was it? The critics collective. I've I've mm. never heard I've never heard that. I had no idea what he's talking about. But as a journalist demo, your ears do prick up and think, Oh, <laughs> that's an that's an interesting line. There might be yeah. there might be a story in that. Um, and there was, and there was. Yeah. Like, I, I I came back from Port Leash yesterday and I saw that story in a couple of outlets, you know. Um and it's not probably the usual spot for a GEA president to you know, usually it's match program notes or, or, you know, usually it's meeting the media during the week. But, you know, Larry might not, not have engaged much with, with that sort of things. You know, uh, you know, he, he hasn't been too publicly vocal since he took over. So that's been his philosophy. But maybe he's using that platform. But I think it would have been better if he had a, a direct target for it. But maybe a match day is not the place for that either, Mick. No, probably not. Uh, just throw a question at you, Demo, here. Uh, Detox 101 again. Is Damien a fan of the halftime interview with selectors? Must be 20 years it was. It's more than 20 years. It's 1995. Some golden moments. Are you going to do it, Jar? We're going to do it. What do you make of it, Damon? I know TG Catter have brought yeah. it back kind of now. I, I quite like it because I yeah. think it's a more than something on the field after. And I know Bubbles of the Wire was given out about, about a mic being shoved under his... Uh, face about a minute after the 16 on Ireland but <laughs> yeah. that kind of raw stuff in the heat at the moment is like that's manna from heaven for us and for viewers at home realistically Not, come here Mick it's fantastic if the right person is sent over to you to answer your question you can get a great insight now mostly they won't send over the right person to you you know I mean I remember after Dublin winning All-Ireland final you know I had to go through their media manager um, after winning an All-Ireland final I, I, I don't know why but that's the level of what you're dealing with Mick but uh 
I was asked who I'd like, and I said, look, in an ideal world, would you bring over Philly McMahon, uh, James McCarthy, and Kevin <laughs> McManaman? And uh, I think they brought over Johnny Cooper, Kieran Kilkenny, and I think maybe Keanu Sullivan, the, the steadiest hands you'll ever yeah, get in your life. Yeah, so yeah, the yeah. point I'm making is you're, you're looking for a, a bit of a, a spark and you're looking for a bit of an insight. And gee, like working in my job on the sideline, like you're all you're trying to do, and I said this over and over again, like, it's never it's never about you for a start make you're only asking a simple question but it's to try and get the trust of somebody that they will that they'll trust you maybe to give an insight or maybe to say what was motivating them or maybe something that happened during the week that that maybe propelled them forward in their preparation you're never looking to to kind of leave somebody out to dry or anything like that that's never the case at all but Genuinely, you have hundreds of thousands of viewers at home and they're looking to get inside the game and they're getting to look in behind the game. And the pre-match thing at this stage, oh, it's tough going, Mick, you know, it really is. And you're just trying to be respectful to these managers all the time because you know they're putting in about 60 hours a week and you know they're putting in maybe 10 months preparation for this day. And uh, But but maybe it's, it's getting to the managers. Like You have to get through a lot of media people now to even get near them. And you know yourself, you're, you're in the midst of it too, Mick, like... A lot of it is true, maybe endorsements or sponsorships now. Um, but for midweek stuff, for match day itself, you're always aware that emotions are high. You're always aware that maybe a, a huge controversy is never around the corner. You do owe, in my opinion, not speaking for anybody else now, but you owe duty of care to the player as well. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but still, your job, your first duty is to get an insight. Um, you know, I'm I'm always at people. Jesus, could we not go into the dressing room? Even with see the jerseys hanging up. Oh yeah, I remember I did a bit with, with Sky Sports and Kilkenny. Racker Cody brought me into the Kilkenny dressing room. No, I'm not sure if Brian Cody knew about it, but uh, Racker brought us in about two hours before a championship game, and it was it was harmless, like Jaffa cakes, wine gums, Lucasaid Sport. Great to see it though. Great absolutely. See it. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's the point I'm making. Like we, we don't help ourselves sometimes promoting the game. Am I a fan of the halftime interview? Yeah, you know, it's clear that one or two people coming over to you have zero interest in chatting to you, but they've obviously been asked by somebody, and I I think it's worth pursuing, probably more so than than pre-match. You might get something out of the halftime. Yeah, I I have to say I always it's a different face. Like I've seen Declan Laughing being interviewed a couple of times for Tipperary that people mightn't like Cahill and Bevins are the kind of front men there and maybe yeah. Tony Round involved. It's good to see. Remember when uh awfully in two thousand it was, you know, they'd be chatting to Pat Flory or to be chatting to Jerk Coughlin. You'd always see a different face. Back in the nineties they used to always have Podge Mull hair and I tell you something, if you wanted someone <laughs> if you wanted something if you wanted something to give you a little nugget, P- P- Podge definitely would anyway. He'd uh, he'd, he, he he'd, he'd struggled to keep it PC, I tell you that. He, he, he would, and you struggle to keep him PC too. And I saw last night there after after Newcastle bet Man United, like uh, Eddie Howe let the, the sky camera into his game, or into his dressing room, uh, while he delivered a post match speech. Now the post match speech was generic enough, yeah. but, but Eddie Eddie Howe is media savvy, like you know, and he knows probably Newcastle need a bit of positive PR as well with the with the ownership and stuff like that. But I I just feel look, we're obviously an amateur association, so I think access like that is going to be slow. But my God almighty, you know, whenever you do get it, it brings the GEA to a new level. And the level of affinity then that viewers have with that team is absolutely incredible. You know, and yeah. I, I, you know, on match days, I'd say to the lads, like, could, could we do an interview walking down the sideline, even having a, a small chat? I remember when, when Tyrone won the All-Ireland final a couple of years ago, I actually got on the pitch and was able to walk up the, towards the hill with Niall Morgan and Petey Hart. And you're having a natural conversation, but they're not consciously aware then that there's a camera or an, av- yeah, an advertising yeah. boarding behind you. It's much more natural. I understand that there's a marketing view to all this, Mick. You have to, you know, sponsors have to get payback. But just the odd breakaway and just to give a, an insight, I think more of that could be welcomed, you know. And the more the more Podgemal hairs we get, the better. But <laughs> they're uh, the rare breed now, I can tell you that much. Last question, Demo, because I have uh, Dennis Bastic waiting in the wings. I'm uh, just wondering, is there any... I haven't teed you up for this, apologies. Is okay. there any... What's your most memorable moment from doing live television? That could be memorable funny, memorable bad, memorable, oh my <laughs> God, how, oh my God, how did this happen? Is there anything, um, anything had that co- stands out maybe from your time in live television? Yeah, so when Tip played Clare, um, and uh, I think Seamus Roach was the referee, and Tipperary got a fairly contentious penalty decision afterwards, and I had to interview Brian, Brian Lohan, after the game, Mick. Uh, that was a, a fair test. 
Jeez, I, I asked the poor men some stupid questions that day because I'd say, uh, I was oh no, no it was it was it was James Owens, James Roach, James Roach is uh, the tip referee back in the day. Yeah, I, that I, was I, that I, was quality I, television now, demo. I have to say it was. Yeah, I think I met James the same day. So absolutely stupid. Forgive me for that. I um, I I was I was nervous enough doing it because you know I knew the the. Uh, I knew I was coming out, Mick, and uh, I, I thought myself it was a harsh enough decisions by uh, by James as well. And uh, but look, he, he made his decision and went for it. Another memorable moment, Mick, was when Limerick won the All Ireland the first time around, and, and Shane Dowling came over to me, and oh, yeah. all the all the emotion. I, just, I threw the ball in, asked Shane a question, and uh, off he went. And he he delivered he delivered an unbelievable interview. To be honest, which is absolutely just all the kind of hurt and he thanked his underage coaches and you could see the see the passion coming out so they're kind of very very memorable ones too and i suppose the last one then from a, a purely biased point of view when tip won the monster football final i i managed to get colin O'Reardon, and oh yeah colin, colin should have been in australia so again it's all about the stories of the people that you're that you're you're interviewing mick and um if sometimes the trick is to know where the stories are and, and ask for a Shane Dowling to be brought over yeah. or ask for a Colin O'Reardon because you know what's going to come out. Um, you know, you know, they're, they're, I suppose the point I make to you before I shut up, knowing their backstory is key to that. Once you know the yeah. backstory, then you know there's a chance of getting it out. And, you know, in a good way, just the battles and resilience that they've shown, like, you know. Yeah. Know your players, I was always told. Know your players. Yeah. yeah. And you're, yeah. it's 100% right. Once, yeah. once, once you know your players, you, the, the questions are easy enough to ask then, you know. Yeah. Demo, thanks a million for joining us. Going to bring Dennis Bass again now. Really all right, Mick. Your time, all right. Thanks. All right, Mick. Bye bye. Dennis, how are you? Good morning. How are you? Good, good, good. Uh, I'm in the Offaly jersey because Offaly had a good weekend, but uh, Dublin had a good weekend as well. What, what were your uh, initial thoughts on the, the 4 6 to, to 11 point win over Derry yeah. in the Division 2 final? Just a bit of a, a bit of excitement. There was probably a bit of frustration during the during the early rounds in the league of, of how they were playing and the results and maybe just that performance or game plan. But yeah, definitely a bit of excitement back now after after yesterday. And like no matter like the division two was probably up and down at different times, but at the end of the day, lots of new players thrown in. Uh the likes of the likes of Newcomb um and a couple of other different guys thrown in and players back on the pitch. And at the end of the day, what were you looking to get out of Division Two? Get probably get game time into new players, go into your squad depth a bit more, and get promoted, and probably get your hands on the title. And you've done kind of you've kind of ticked every box, really. Hundred percent, and and to get that good test at the end, you're coming up to uh, another team who are possible contenders. You know, Ulster champions last year, and to to go and obviously a tough game away up in Celtic Park, but then to to kind of put it right in Crow Park was really good for the team. Do you would you still uh, would you still follow the games very closely? Would you go into games? Do you, would you? We yeah. had any league games. Were you in there yesterday? Yeah, I wasn't in there yesterday. I was away on a on a rugby trip actually uh, with the little fella. So, um, but yeah, I got back and got got to see the game. But I try to get in as many as I can. Um, obviously, you see a lot more. I think we're, we're still lacking in terms of the TV piece of of seeing the bigger picture. You'd always be looking out and how people are setting up for kickouts and strategies, stuff like that. So you don't get to see that unless you're you're inside, unfortunately. Are you uh, are you kind of a student of the game in the sense where you like to, you'd like to see the behind the goals angle, you'd like to see the overhead angle, you'd like to see what's going on? I was only chatting Damien about it. It is it's because you you want to show the people that are watching it at home. You want to give them a view at least of what people are seeing in the stadium. Yeah, and it's very hard for a commentator to get that across because there's so much much going on. So, like the likes of the matchup, the stun the game picked up on James McCarthy, the job he was doing off the ball, uh, you know, in terms of his tight mark, and then you can't see that because the the cameras are following the ball all the time. So, yeah, it's probably a different game when you're at it, and um, but you don't get to see the replays either. That's that's what the what the TV brings you at home. You get to see the replays again, and and that's what's not always shown in Crow Park either. Uh, where do you think Dublin are at at the moment, Dennis? Um, I suppose it was good to exact a bit of revenge with Derry from the the, the Celtic Park game, even getting more, a bit of game time into Mannion. Dean Rock going off is probably a bit of a worry, I'd say, as well. But where do you see the Mac going into the summer? I, I think you can park. I think it's a real... The season is two halves. It's always been, a, as a player, a kind of you get to the league, you get a break, and then you come back, you know, your settled team, you have your, your squad, really. And that's there's a lot of squad players early on in the year, a World Cup, Sigurds and all that. You're carrying a good few numbers. And then after the league, you probably settle down into your 30 players. And it's a real kind of 
okay, here we go kind of thing. You know, this is it now. Here we are for the summer. I think Dublin are in a good place. A lot of players still not around. They're with game time. And you're kind of saying, if they can manage to get these guys back on the pitch, they're going to have a serious, serious squad or serious attempt at the at the title. Would you have heard, um, having been, you know, very, you know, obviously very closely associated with the squad in relatively recent years, like, is there a sense of the kitchen sink been thrown at this one? Because that's kind of what it looks like to the outside person you see. Like, I think it's amazing for, for Desi Farrell to, to bring an All-Ireland winning manager like Pat Gilroy. You're obviously the first All-Ireland that you won to bring him back into the fold just to and leave, you know, not saying that Desi has any ego, but it's a big thing for a manager to, you know, leave your ego at the door and bring a big personality like Pat in. I don't know how they got Jack back. I don't know how they got Paul back. And then even mm. Stephen Cluxton coming back as well. It has the looks of we're going to do everything possible uh, to get our hands back in Sam Maguire. Yeah, I, I would have felt that it's kind of that's the case every year, but just different different things happen. So when when Paul and Jack left to, to go travelling, they were still trying to kick and sink at it. You're just doing it without those guys. But I think Pat Gilroy come back in as a big coup. Everywhere he's went, he's done really really good job, and he's really good man manager and style, and gets the most out of guys. And you know, it looks like his fingerprints are over over getting Stephen to come back in you know so that's that's a that's a huge boost I would think for for the team getting we're still kind back, of, yeah, yeah yeah we're still kind of unclear about what Pat's role is in the setup but if you were to hazard a guess like what what do you think you would obviously know his strengths um particularly from you know 11 and 12 obviously as well and before then what do you think he's kind of bringing to the table look at when you've got a, a kind of football brain you're bringing your thoughts, your views on, on what you're seeing on the pitch. So, you know, he's not he's not on the sideline. I believe he's up in the up in the stands watching the game. So he's getting messages in. I presume he's getting messages in or, or seeing from the higher higher viewpoint, which most teams do up in the up in the stat box when they're getting down different messages, seeing seeing the overall picture. So look, I think whatever he's whatever he's doing, it's it's working. You know, they've kind of they've pushed on a bit. That was a really good show on yesterday, really good statement of intent i would say you know whereas they've been stuttering along maybe early on but it, that was a real you know okay this is what we're about we're going to go at you we're going to go fast we're going to go hard we're going to try and open you up for goals and they did against one of the most defensive teams in the league it's almost like a switch was flicked nearly a half time and the approach kind of changed they kicked four points in the first half then all of a sudden like could have had like seven or eight goals nearly john yeah, well, probably could have had a hat trick you know yeah, they had two goal chances, possibly fell to the wrong people in, in the first half, you know, so they could have had a couple couple there. There was a lot of errors, a lot of missed shots, dropped short. So I think they were kind of warming up or getting, they were figuring it all out in the first half and then it then it clicked. And obviously the big change in point of would feel would be Conor Glass going off. That, that was a really good battle there around the midfield. I really enjoyed watching that, seeing how it panned out. And it was just so unusual for both goalkeepers to be kicking long nearly every kick out it was it was fantastic to see a real real battle around that that middle third which is which is great is the midfield battle one that you zone in on in particular because it's kind of course, where you were yeah. for a long time yeah yeah of course and obviously we're playing with with james and, and brian Fenton, so you obviously watching how they're doing they um you know you don't in the past maybe you don't get as many times they go up and jump and try and fetch the ball. A lot of us doing short, working out possession. So just to see both goalies just putting it down and, and giving a good bang out to the halfway line was was really good to see. Yeah, we've been interesting in the one actually because with the with the with the rule being changed now, where players have to be back at the forty five, does that change your approach to the? To the throw-in, and I know it, like Dublin got the goal against Kerry. In uh, Merchant's goal was directly from the throw-in, and it was I think David Moore nearly had it when Merchant kind of came in and stole it. But would it change your approach to the throw-in a lot, which is a vital kind of set piece in every game, realistically? But that was that was always a rule. That that rule hasn't changed. Uh, they're gone back to the forty-five now. They used to be at the sixty-five. Yeah, at the sixty. Okay, so gone yeah. back further. Yeah. So even well, yesterday, you'd see the linesman trying to hold back. Like, hold them the back, and they still, still didn't go back. They still didn't no, go back. No. Um, yeah, it was definitely like when we were working on it, it was a case of guys are getting in as quickly as possible. You know, you're really going after because most of the time, a midfielder doesn't catch the, the troll, the breaks around that area and it breaks quite close. So you're really flooding that in. You can see set plays, you can see teams working off set plays. If you, if you can win and get forward, you only have six defenders in the opposing team. So it's a chance to, you know, create some space, get the ball in early. And 
I think Fenton was it last year, the year before, got one hit, hit one off the post, ran straight up the middle as well. So there is a plan there, and you can see more teams, uh, you know, do they have an option to use that now or try and push? It's very difficult. You don't know what way the ref's going to throw the ball. You don't know where yeah. it's going to land. So it is a bit of a lottery, but if you get one out of 10, it works. You look at Morrison's. Would, would you have had a plan with your midfield partner of, I'm up, you're down? Would, and like, of course, throughout your yeah. Career even? yeah, yeah. All the time, yeah. yeah. We'd go off and we'd work on that and we'd try and, yeah, whoever it is. And you'd watch the video clips of what they do as well. So you'd have a, you know, a good understanding. You'd, you'd see their trope for, for the last league games, you know, six, seven, eight league games. And you'd be trying to counteract what they're doing or try and implement something to, to win that first possession. Because it might seem like a small thing, but if you're able to get your hands on a ball, like I think Dublin had a goal within 60 seconds in the COVID All Ireland final. Um, they've had a couple of early goals. Merchant's goal was at the start of the second half. Like that can be a game turning move, like realistically. Yeah, and it's a kind of a sucker punch for the other team as well, you know, because you, you've maybe you've reset at half time, you've got all the instructions, and next ball, a minute later, there's a ball over a bar against you. So, yeah, no, it's um, it's definitely something we work. I think most teams, it's it is to find margins, it's the set plays, it's you know, have you spent time working on that area? Because you never know when it might might happen. So, just I said there about the the switch almost been flicked in the second half. Now, do you yeah. expect Dublin to go up another couple of gears for championship? Now they have everyone back. We're still probably a bit, you know, unsure of what Jack McCaffrey's position is. He's played a small bit, but he's kind of been away from the scene now a bit. We haven't seen him in action, but. Do you, do you expect them to go up a couple of notches now again? Maybe like last year, because they, they were a different team come championship last year compared to league. Yeah, well, I think you have to take into account that they've been playing in Division 2. So, you know, what, what they've done in Division 2 is not going to be good enough or anywhere near good enough to go and, and try and win it out, you know, when you're going to come up against the top teams who've been playing each other. Really, you've seen how competitive Division 1 was. Like, there, any of those teams, you know, are strong enough to beat Dublin if they're not playing well. So, you would like to think that it's, yeah, it's foot to the metal now. They go back into camp, a bit of a break, and then they go back in and then they, they push on. And it's, the way the structure is, you know, it's going to give them time to continue to get a settled team, to continue to give game time throughout Leinster, maybe through the group stage as well. So they're, they're going to still have opportunities where guys can get more game time, guys returning to play. So we don't think we've seen seen it all yet, but in terms of the gear, you would like to think that there's another gear or two there where they can to work on between now and then and then hopefully be able to, you know, do it on the pitch really. I mentioned Cluxton earlier. Was was that a surprise to you, him coming back? Of course, of course it was a surprise, yeah. Um yeah. I I would think it's a hugely positive move. Um just having spent time with him in the dressing room, what he brings, um, whether he you know, whether he kicks the ball, you you'll see in, in the games is, you know, your seventy minute game, but the actual time you're with the guys in the camp and the in the training games, all of that. That's that's hours and hours every week. So that's that's where you're gonna see he's gonna have a huge involvement in, in that, in the camp, in the team. And you know, you might not see him on the pitch, but you'll see maybe you see the, the impact he will have, which I think will be hugely positive for the group having someone like that there. He, like you mentioned there, he's a student of the game. I would think he was, you know. He's a teacher. He's he's definitely a student of the game as well. He he understands the game, reads the game, and analyzes the game really, really well. So I think the strengths that he bring in in terms of looking at opposition, looking at tweaking what Dublin are doing themselves. So it's, it'll be a huge advantage. David O'Hanlon has been brilliant this year by all accounts, and he was brilliant again yesterday. Um, do you expect Cluxton to push him to the pin of his collar? Like he's he's back. Like I I I imagine. You know, from being around him, he's a fierce competitor. Like he won't be happy with sitting on the line either. I'd imagine he'd he'd want to be playing. Like who does? Like tell me someone who likes of anyone from one to thirty in, in the panel. Like nobody likes sitting on. He's gonna be no different. So, um. But I thought it was you know Desi answered the question yesterday about you know should you throw him on for the for the second half, give him some game time. He, I thought he answered it really well. That that's it's not what it's about. It's no tokenism. If if he's mm. good enough and he's He's competing well, which I believe he will. He stays injury free. I think he'll push, he'll push hard, and we won't know. Uh, looking from the outside in, we won't know how the, how that's going you know, until I suppose the jerseys are given out match day. 
Had you heard any murmurs of him coming back? Like, I, I think it's fascinating. Like, it's amazing that it was kept that, that quiet. Yeah, do we know how long he was back? Like, was he back a week or two? They're, saying, they're, saying, two, they're saying two or three weeks. Like, but, like, that's, is, like, you've been in that camp as well. That's a really good sign of, of a camp. It's a really good that's sign. That's squad. Same with a workplace. Like, it's that, that things aren't getting out. Same with a squad. It's a really good sign of... I would say the attitude of the players, the attitude of the management, that everything will stay in house. There's, pro- there's probably not anyone that's that disgruntled because if there was, it probably would have broke out. And I think that's a great sign of where the squad is at. A huge sign, a huge. And, and for this time of year, you would have, you know, your extra players, your club players, some fringe players who are in and out of the panel or on for one game and off and on a, an extended panel. So to have that close knit, that even those players who weren't maybe fully committed or bought into the whole Dublin ethos and, and process. I think it was a big, big sign, a big, big sign that he can go back and he can train for a couple of weeks and nobody, nobody heard a word. So it's, it's good. It's, it just shows there's a bit of a tightness there. There's a bit of a, you know, togetherness, a bit of a bond in that group that you may not have seen. And only because of this that we're actually realising, well, actually there's, there's a bit going on with these guys there. They're coping well, but they're playing in Division Two. They're trying to get through work, and at the same time, you know, they're they're going about their business and not, you know, selling stories or leaking anything out of the group, yeah. which is which is really good. Was there ever anything like that throughout your own career where you know someone was back or there was a big injury or something like that, and it was kind of like, lads, this doesn't leave the camp, or is is something like that even said? Yeah, yeah, all the time, all the time. So we'd have fellas who'd be carrying stuff you know so they, they wouldn't be training or they'd be minding each other and you know we'd have a lot of um you know we train in very open area in dcu and st Clair. there's there's houses all around the pitch so sometimes it was difficult and and things got out or you know we were playing challenge games and, and things got out from challenge games and different things like that but you know i think over time we, we definitely built up resilience of um you know we just got on with it like we named you would see we named a team and it was a different team every time we went out. So that would be like you know, that would yeah. be like you at all now. <laughs> I know. So it was a big, big case of it. Eventually got, you know, maybe a bit comical where you don't actually believe the team that's coming out now. There's going to be a couple of changes and, and that's that's kept. But look, no fellas got used to that and that was difficult. There was guys you know, you'd be going home and, and not telling your parents uh, either that you're starting or either that you're dropped, you know, and that, that was difficult. So the team was coming out, it was on the radio. You could be getting messages of, of well done or hard luck. And it was actually the opposite. So, yeah, you know, fellas, fellas had to manage that, which was which was difficult. Definitely, dif- definitely challenging. You know, that's, a, that's a difficult scenario, isn't it? Like, you know, it, 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 Alexa, it's, a, it's the point. It's a, like it could be the opposite of people are congratulating you. You should be delighted. You know, maybe you're not starting. And it's very yeah. like, it's very hard to hold it in. Then on the other side of people are like, oh, you definitely should be starting. I would have had you in. And you know, you are starting. <laughs> I but know. You're wearing number 23 or whatever. I know. And, and like, it's it's your family and friends, you know, the people who, who you're close to. And they're the ones that you're, you know, you're, you're keeping it away from because obviously they mean good. But at the same time, they're so happy for your sad for you know, or, or they're on your side or they're shouting for you. So, yeah, really, really interesting dynamic to try and go through that every every championship game. There was it was always a couple of people who were impacted. Whatever you were doing anyway, it's rubbed off in the Limerick hurdles because <laughs> Mike Mike Casey um played last year against Cork in the championship. He hadn't played all year. He was only coming back from an injury and he was wearing number seventeen. And his parents were sitting in the stand and it was announced over the intercom that he was starting and they actually didn't even know that he no, was he, starting. Yeah. So, but a lot there of times um even family kind of understand i think and don't even ask you anymore ask, a lot of time yeah. because maybe they know like would that be the case where like some family members just don't ask because they know you're putting, yeah, putting know. in an awkward they spot know. yeah and, and they try and not like obviously everyone wants to know the team or whatever and you kind of just have to say, look, wait wait until it's announced and you know don't be don't be asking the friday night after just just get on with it and wait and enjoy the game kind of thing so they mean well in that but yeah, definitely over time we got to a stage where they kind of knew what's best, you know. Don't ask about tickets and don't ask about, about the team. Yeah. Yeah. What would be your what would be your best memories from, from being with the Dubs then? It's obviously a f- five all Ireland from your career. You were there during that golden era as well. Like yeah. are there memories on the field? Are they, you know, bonds created? Anything in particular stand out? Oh well, look, twenty eleven, just the the Royal Rovers finishing the way it was, who was against, like that that just that's etched there now in history and I played a little part in that. So that stands out obviously my first one as well. But 
No, I think looking back, looking back and you're seeing it was the, the trips away, the camps, the training camps, the bond, actually going through the work and the hard work with the guys. I think that's what I, what I took most and what I missed most out of it was, was more the, the training room and the dressing room and, and all that piece and the bonds of just, you know, getting through work, getting through, going through difficult situations with guys and coming out and, and performing. So I think that's what I probably miss most, but uh, the memories, 2013, I, I came on in the final and made a bit of an impact that day and that, that felt really good as well. And that was a, that was a close match too. So we've had some, some really, really good days um, and they've been exciting and they've been close. And, you know, I think they all mean something different to me in terms of, you know, what I've played and the impact I've had on them. But probably the first one was the, was the most spectacular because it was coming from a time when we were being beaten regularly and not getting over the line. And, and you know, that was really challenging. I think not that it got easier after that, but it definitely, we, we got a huge amount of confidence from that win and that, that helped us then on in the future years. So. Is it hard to leave it behind when you've, you know, when you've dedicated your life to it and you're with these lads like four or five times a week maybe and, you know, that's that's your bubble, that's your scene almost. Yeah, How yeah. difficult did you find it to leave that behind and move on? And it's it's nearly like starting another life because there's a lot of time to be filled and you probably have to fill it with something. If you don't, you're probably, you probably have a, a bit of a, a kind of a form on you kind of get lost maybe almost. Yeah, like it's... It's, it's not hard to leave because you have to leave when you have to leave, you know, and that's that's it. Your time just stops and you come away. So, yeah, it's difficult leaving the WhatsApp group, coming away from that group. And I think even though having having close relationships, you, you kind of have to leave the guys, get on with it. So the guys who were there, it's still a job to do. They're still they're still involved and, and that's their prerogative and that's what they have to go after and chase. And I think once you step away, you kind of step away from that and they're doing their thing and you have to go on then and do your thing. So look, it's a big, huge void and you still still love the game, still love watching the game, still support them and still want to see them do well, really well. And, you know, there is a gap there, but I think that's when you know it's coming. I, I had a, you know, a couple of years where I knew I was obviously maybe older starting off. So I was old in the group as well. And I knew that my time was running out. So it allowed me then to, you know, prepare, I suppose, mentally, physically and and to really enjoy those last the last bit of time I had which which was special. You mentioned about the eleven final. I have to bring this up. I'll ask you firstly though, are you are you a wrestling fan or a Shawn Michaels fan? <laughs> I, yeah, I watched a bit of wrestling all right, yeah. It is, yeah. Oh. Good man, well something happened in the 2011 final, and I'm just going to bring it bring it up on screen here now because you'd Go have to it. be you'd, you'd have to you'd have to be a wrestling fan uh to uh to maybe appreciate this or even know about about this and just bring it up on screen here now so Dennis Bastic takes a hard tackle and boom he's, he's oh. back he's, he's back up on his feet um I've never seen the like of that before Dennis it was uh as Never I, again, I, I, hopefully. Yeah. No, I I will be I will be a big wrestling fan, but talk me uh, talk me through that. Oh, look, uh, I didn't plan it or anything like that. It just uh, I don't know what, took a took a heavy knock, uh, got a free, won a free, and um, I just yeah, I just wanted to get up as quick as I can, could, and that was the quickest way, and yeah, kind of maybe a little bit of showboat and the carry to saying that you're not going to keep us down today or whatever but uh yeah i've never done it again i haven't done it done it since but um yeah it's something i could do i didn't practice or something i was able to do and i just whatever came over me at that time and, yeah and I, I had a lot of people say to me afterwards about them being in the stadium and seeing that and it gave them a little you know a little bit of fire in their belly or whatever g them up a bit so yeah i'm happy happy i did that YouTube called it a ninja flip up, but any wrestling fan would call it a, a kip up. I think they call it. Shawn Michaels well, it, was brilliant at doing it. Yeah, when two wrestlers would fall in the middle of the ring and it would look like neither of them were going to get up, he would just fly back up. And was it not something that you practiced at all? It was just was it something that you're able? To, you had to have practiced it a small bit. Well, I did it like so maybe when I was younger and stuff like that. But no, not no, I wasn't practicing it before games and <laughs> with hopping and soul or anything like that. But um. Yeah, I think it'd be more like the Undertaker getting up now at the moment. So I'm just sitting up slowly. That's what that's what it'd be like now. Um, but yeah, no, it was I, a, a nice little clip to have in the, in the final. I find it hard to believe that you know, in coppers after an All Ireland final, that there wasn't like a circle around you and you're lying in the middle. Of the Did that ever happen? Anything like that? Uh, look, there was a few. Uh, I remember um, 
we had a, a kind of a booze cruise among the holidays and yeah everything everything was uh on limits that night and everyone got off and, and did their did their dance moves and whatever so it was, it was yeah came into play again there that night so but no i don't want to ruin it you know i don't want to go and, and try and attempt it now and then not, not do it and fail so i'll just leave it at that i did it then and that's that well, it's twelve years later. I tell you, you'd be doing, you'd be doing well if you're still able to do well. are, you, are you still kicking ball, or Dennis? Are you still playing, or? Yeah, still playing a bit of junior with the club. Yes. Yeah. So, um, look, I'm enjoying it. I really love the, you know, the. I suppose for me, it's it's re- relaxing now. I would say, or it's enjoyable. So the the stress and the, you know, the turmoil that you go through as an inter county player of always having to be on and that that pressure pressure zone that you're in all the time you know every single day every training session and now we can go out kick around a bit of ball and like i'm still competitive and i don't i don't like losing but it's still it's i find it enjoyable now you know where i i don't get worked up or i don't mind if, if things go wrong or not going well i can actually really enjoy the football and, and um look it's great to play with the club guys some older some younger and it's um no i still enjoy it. i still enjoy putting on the boots and yeah someday that probably very soon as well i'll just have to stop putting them on because it's, it's going to be better for me and and my body so and that's, that's coming soon so it's a good buzz kind of with young fellas in particular 17 or 18 kind of learning their trade even showing them little bits and pieces and that type of thing just a few little bits of cuteness bit little bits of tricks to the tricks to the trade like that's as in, like yeah. i find, find i played a bit of senior b back home now and a couple lads because I'm 36, there could be lads playing that are 18, that are half your age, and they're a bit raw, and that kind of thing, and it's great to be even just, even to have the, I always find it even, that you develop yourself nearly as a person, because it, even chatting them, they're in a different world of TikTok, and God only knows what else, like things yeah. that we couldn't have imagined when we were younger, it's a kind of a cool experience in that way as well. It's an eye opener to see how you get reminded very quickly how how old you are and, and yeah the the polar opposites between the generations. But yeah, like I said, 18, 19, 20 year olds, you're double their age. Uh, you do get to you know give them a bit of advice, a bit of information, but at the same time, sometimes <laughs> you think it's going over the head and they're not listening or they take it in. But yeah, I would feel that I would have, have a lot of. Um, you know, experience or thoughts on, on how to play or what to do in certain situations. And, and I definitely think that that can be lacking in guys who have had a lack of coach coming up through a certain age or systems and, and how to play. And I think we touched on earlier about the understanding of the game or student of the game. I feel there's a lot of footballers right now and um, decision making, would I would say the biggest the biggest issue was why did you do that, that in that situation? Like, look, this is what you should have done. This is the reasons why. So, yeah. That only comes from coaching and practice and being in those situations before. So, you know, you'd really like to get time with guys and you think you could offer offer something in terms of, you know, to play and how to play and what to do at certain times. And I think that's an area that's that could be hugely beneficial if you if you're going with underage teams and, and you know can build it in from a, from an early age with these guys and that, that allowed them when they're when they're playing junior football, they may, might not have the the ability or the skill but at the same time if you know what to do and you're in the right place at the right time it'll, it'll work out for you just a quick one i should have asked you on cluxton what was it like dealing with him as a midfielder because you're obviously there were short kickouts and different things in but those kind of you know arrowed like 80 yard balls like was it a case of in your head i just need to be in a certain position and he will put it there and what was the understanding like between the two e yeah i think you know the accuracy um, you're dealing with it day in, day out. And I think, you know, when you, I kind of felt when I went back to the club, then you really appreciate it much, much more, you know, when you're, mm. when you're going for a kick out or a ball and next of all, it's one foot to the opposite side and you have to check and your man gets it instead. Like, I think we were dealing with that where you're, you're running onto the ball or it's landing on your head or it's in the position that you wanted to be in. And you kind of, you did take that for granted because you were getting it every single, single train station from not only him but from from our backup keepers as well. So in fact, great keepers along. But I think that was the big the, the accuracy piece of landing on your chest, landing over your head, running and, and not checking your run. And um, you know, you see guys picking up the ball or being out in space, but like there's a skill in, in that putting it into the right where a guy doesn't have to check or stop or slow down. And I think that's it's a real launch pad, launch pad, and and you can see David O'Hanlon doing it, doing it at the moment as well. Last question, Dennis, because I have Cora Staunton waiting to come in. Um, yeah. 
can Dublin win the All-Ireland? Well, they can win the All-Ireland. Will they win the All-Ireland? I would think if they can get their, their squad back up to the full depth, yeah, they can win, definitely. I think if you get Jack back, you get Howard back, guys, guys all know from well. You know, I can imagine one of our strengths was, you know, the, the training games. I think if you get that up and you get to the training squad much, much stronger because all the guys are available, I think they have a really good shot of, you know, getting to a final and, and, and winning. That's the job. It's one of the most exciting championships in a long time. It is, uh, yeah. yeah, it's brilliant. Dennis, thanks a million for joining us. Really Thank appreciate you. your time. All the best. Right, See you now. Delighted to be joined by Cora Staunton. Uh, Cora, how are you? Hi, Mike. How are you? Not too bad. Dennis has laid down the gauntlet there already. He already <laughs> thinks the dubs are back. I'm sure everyone in or in your neck of the woods thinks Mayo are back. Yeah, I think Mayo will take that, though, if Mayo can hear or put the pressure back on Dublin and, and put them as favourites for the All-Ireland. But I think it's very hard to probably keep things um, on any on a calm keel here, especially after the performance yesterday and I suppose the performance right throughout the league. Um, you know, it's been um, a very good league for Kevin McStay, obviously new manager in. And yeah, I suppose that was topped off yesterday by... Uh, I wouldn't say a brilliant performance yesterday, but a, a good enough performance to, to get them over the line. They often say, Cora, that it's difficult for you know a manager to come in. You mightn't see a stamp of a manager on a team straight away. But Kevin has really hit hit the ground running. They play a nice style. I think yesterday was one of their best victories in the sense of probably you know plenty of different things didn't go right. Um, maybe as opposed to in other league games, but like he's really hit the ground running. It's been the perfect start, really. Yeah, it has, and I think yeah, he, he initially. Um, came in and put his own stamp on it in many different ways. And I suppose you have to look at Kevin has been trying to get that Mayo job for, for a long time. So um, he had his ideas and, and ways that he wanted to play. And I, I suppose you look at it, um, he brought in a lot of youth that was there before, but probably didn't get an opportunity. Jack Coyne, Sam Callaghan in particular um, in, in that back line. But then it was the move of, you know, Connor Loftus to centre back, um, Jonathan O'Connor back out to midfield. Obviously, Aiden, the big talking point to, to into full forward, and then you know he's the likes of um, to, or Ryan O'Dun, who didn't play very much last year, who was injured from George the year. Tommy Conroy, um, who's back from injury as well. Um, you know, adding Killian O'Connor, who who was who was there last year, but probably wasn't fully fit. So, yeah, he's put his own stamp. Whether it's bringing in young players, um, of Colum Reap, obviously a huge one that was um, you know, man of the match yesterday, a new goalkeeper. So, he's either brought in new players, um moved all players into different positions um, and then he's had the luxury, I suppose, of the likes of Ryan and Tommy Conroy and Killian in particular, um, who was, who's been injured for majority last year or not back to full fitness. So, yeah, he's really put a stamp on it and it's great to see they're playing a really exciting brand of football at times and I suppose that's what Mayo supporters love. You mentioned Colin Reap there. Uh, we might as well chat about the, you know, the potential Yellow card, black card, red card incident. What did you make? What did you make of yourself in in real time? Yeah, in real time in in Croker yesterday, I thought no, I thought I even thought it was a harsh yellow card in in real time. But again, it, you're um, you're a long way away from play. I suppose then watching it back on TV last night, um, it was it was very difficult for him to to move out of position. To be honest, he was coming at full a full flight. Uh, I suppose the only thing that probably stuck or that doesn't look the best is when his, his I think it's his left leg is stuck out. Um, that's the only thing. But I think it had been a very harsh uh, black card to give, and in real time for the referee to be able to give that, you know, you can see why he didn't. So, yeah, it, it's you know it's on the verge of probably a, a, to me a, a free kick maybe to a yellow card. So. Um, I know Porrick Joyce was very aggrieved after the match and, you know, is that mind game is going into a couple of weeks' time as well. Who knows? But, um, you know, I thought he was superb. Um, I, I think I had said it to a couple of people around me probably 40 minutes into the match that, you know, he'd be, he'd be man of the match. Just his free taking, his 45s, his, his goal saving, just everything. You know, he was just very calm in, in, in goal and, you know, has been right throughout the league. You know, people have really haven't talked that much about him, but... You know, he's he's a newbie into the panel, you know, obviously with Rob Hinley there, David Clark in the past. Um, you know, he's really stepped up um, and, and done well for me right throughout the league. Uh, I didn't think it was anything like, remember the, the famous German goalkeeper, Harold Schumacher, at the time he took out uh, Batison in the 1982 World Cup. Like, he absolutely cleaved them and, his, you know, he actually turned his body. There's actually someone from AO, Cora, has it, I don't have it offhand now, but they actually broke down the incident into four still pictures. And it looks like Reap's leg only comes across 
upon contact from Johnny Heaney. That's what it looks like from the pictures. I think it was probably a yellow, and I think it was fair enough. I don't think he deserved to, to see red. I think probably what Parik Joyce is most aggrieved about is the fact that he lost a player out of it. And he had to come off a couple of minutes later. Um, that meant Comer coming into play, but that puts Johnny Heaney back maybe going into championship now. It could be, uh, I don't know, it could be a very bad dead leg is probably what it looked like. But I'd say that's nearly more what he's... Agree- if the ball had went into the net and the player hadn't to come off, I think it would have been okay, you know, that he was just dished out a yellow or whatever, you know? Yeah, and I did see that on um, social media this morning. That was Cormac O'Malley had that, that broken down, all right? Yeah. Um, and, and it looks like that, yeah. It, it was probably, as I say, a yellow card. Um, and he obviously gave the free kick in, but yeah, it would have been a very harsh black. And as I said, that's very hard for a referee to give, you know, that's probably a little bit away from play. And, you know, if you're given a black card, you have to be sure that that's, that's what you're given, you know, if it's the right call. So, yeah, um, yeah I, I, I just think, yeah, I suppose I was talking, spoken about last night on TV and there was calls for a black card. I even heard a red card, so... Uh, yeah, I think that's probably a Johnny Heaney coming off early because he's a key player for Galway um, and bringing Comer on that early. I suppose they probably want to have him on more later in the game more as an impact sub. But um, no, overall, may all be happy, I suppose, if, if you're to look at a couple of things that they really need to work on. Galway had four goal chances um, and Mayo were probably wide open on a couple of occasions and only for Reap's um, heroics. Um, you know, that's a, probably a worry um, that, you know, Kevin will look at. I think we'd probably one goal chance that Conor Gleeson saved. Um, and I suppose, you know, it's probably going back to that. We probably just need to get a little bit more scores from play from our forward line. I think, um, you know, I think it was Jordan Flynn, James Carr, that kicked um, points from play. But everything either came from freeze or marks and are from, from outside our forward line. So that's just been a picky if you want to. Look at the couple of five percent to improve for for championship. I'm sure there are things Kevin McStay is looking at already this morning. Did you think the referee was um, more sympathetic towards Aidan O'Shea than most referees have been? Because I almost think when you're that big, that I don't know if referees expect you to be able to look after yourself a bit better. But he was to me, he was fouled on nearly every occasion. He got a free yesterday, but there's several games, and I'm thinking back to even particularly the. 2015 semi-final when he was on Philly McMahon where it's almost like oh he's a big lad he should be able to deal with that almost whereas if it was someone else they'd be given freeze in I thought I thought the referee kind of blew when they were freeze but a lot of time in recent years I don't think he's been getting calls like that yeah I, I did I actually said it at, at the game as well to someone that Jesus the, the referee has been very um, nice to Aiden today um you know, because normally he doesn't get them freeze. And, you know, I, I suppose the biggest thing is four of them freeze that he got were all scorable. Now, we didn't score them yeah. all, but and they're all in scorable positions. So I don't know, is, is that a thing that now he's playing deeper and inside that the referees are more aware of, you know, the foul and what rather than if it's a route around midfield, they kind of let, let things go. Um, it's it's interesting. I, I don't know, um, you know, will it, will it come to the heat of the championship? Will some of them freeze be kind of let go? Referees are, are, are probably a little bit more lenient and, um, seems to let things go, but yeah, no, it, he certainly I did think at the time, but you know when you look back at the game and and all of the frees were there, um, so yeah, as Mayo supporters we'll take that all the time, but you know I think Aiden has been a big massive plus for us in the league this year, his performances, um, so obviously Kevin is doing something getting them, getting the right out from you know he was a bit a little bit different like yesterday he didn't play that traditional for four position he was around the ground a lot more, but um you know he looks really fish and up for the fight, um, you know, and really probably re-energised. And, you know, that's that's a great that's a great plus for Mayo football. What do you make of, Cora, the fact, you know, a week between a league final and championship, um, it was described in our paper and the, the Independent this morning as, you know, been in purgatory because it's like, you know, a big game a week before a big championship game. It's almost like a, a poison chalice almost. If you go if you go for it and pick up injuries or whatever, it's it's kind of an awkward spot. But just a couple of quick quotes from Kevin McStay on it. He just said, uh, I'm relieved, quite satisfied, delighted. And there is a part of me saying, cool down now because we have to get ready for next Sunday. Um, that's just the pity of it, the timing of it. But that's nothing anybody can do anything about. But overall, I'm just delighted. Yeah, it's great to come up with a national, to win a national title. So I'm very pleased. It's an awkward kind of a position where like, they can't even really enjoy it too much because... And I, I saw a tweet from Ed, Edward McGreal which said, seven days from the Ross Common game is worth remembering. An incredible stat. The last three times Mayo won the National Football League, they were beaten in Connacht with Rossies 2019, 2001 and all the way back in 1970. It's an incredible stat. Might not be relevant, but shows Rossies' ability to ambush. Like, it's just, it's such a difficult one to, 
marry the, the the enjoyment of winning a national title with, OK, we need to get our feet back down the ground straight away. We have this ambush coming in a week's time. Yeah, I, like personally, I think it's wrong. It should, there should be at least two weeks, if not three weeks, between a national final and your first round of championship. Um, you know, I suppose if you look at players there, uh, that you know, it's their first time um, possibly appearing in Crow Park, first time winning a national title, Colin Reap being one. Um, there's a lot of other young lads there as well. And you just don't get the enjoyment to go out and celebrate it. And that that's lost now. You know, you can't say in two weeks' time or even a week's time we play Roscommon and, and Kevin lets them, you know, have a, a night out. It, this, that celebration has then gone. The national title, you know, it's not that it's forgotten about, but, you know, they move on after probably they, they go back to training probably tomorrow night. So, yeah, I think it's wrong by the GEA. I think the cat fixtures can, can certainly be tweaked to make it, um, you know, why Mayo need to be out um, on the 9th of April. I don't know, you know, there's only a Connacht court final and Connacht semi-final. I think it just could be could be moved better, um, you know, so... Yeah, and, and I do think for James or for Kevin McStu, I think he will be worried a little bit going into it, you know, okay, because he'll have the he'll have the players, um, you know, well tuned in. But you know, seven days after winning the national title, the high of coming kind of in Crow Park, forty-five thousand, and then into McHale Park, you know, it's you know, it's not that Mayo have everything to lose, but it's really Ross Common have nearly a, a, a just a, a go at Mayo because you know Mayo are going to win this big favourites now and yeah it's probably a little bit of a worry that you know can you get that performance week in week out um you know especially seven days and c- can you get up to the to the pitch of the game again and you know I, I think I read a couple of things on Twitter this morning Omeo can can change thing, things up and, and bring players in you know Kevin is not known for that I know for the Monaghan League game he's he's kept really with the same um core group of players and even his substitutes bringing on like he's not using five subs all the time and if he is they're all quite near the end of the game so um, yeah, he, he'll stick with the main players. You know, Mayo went into the, the yesterday with probably nearly a fully fit squad, bearing De Hessian and Killian O'Connor. So, you know, they're the only two that really has to come back in. And, um, you know, I think by all accounts, both of them will be okay for next Sunday and could have been risked for yesterday. But, um, you know, obviously the important game is next Sunday. Surely there's no scenario where we should be punishing winners or punishing high achieving teams. Like you're actually punishing teams for getting to a league final, which just to me seems a bit bizarre. Yeah, well, and I just think it seems even more bizarre in a in a province where you know we've you know five teams <laughs> we're yeah, trying yeah. to get a a Connacht championship ran off on the ninth of April. You know, ran started on the ninth of April. Where other other provinces that have a lot more teams. <laughs> You know they're they're pushing it out, um, you know, further weeks. So that's where I suppose the struggle is. Um, so yeah, I hundred percent agree. Why you know punish winners? Sometimes you know you're you probably look at the start of the year. Kevin, I'm sure did was it a benefit for me to get to the league final and and compete in it a week out from championship? Obviously, you know he thought it was, and, and especially a first year manager in that you know he wants to st- get his stamp on the team and you know get them you know humming, and he has right throughout the league. So. Yeah, I just think it's madness, and I don't know if that's you know a Connacht um, GA or if it's if it's National GA, you know that's um, doing them fixtures. But by all accounts, there should be always two weeks, at least minimum of two weeks between the National League and, and when Championship starts. No, without a doubt. Uh, just to, to chat a quick briefly about um, your neighbor, your neighbor, near neighbors in Sligo. That was a, that was a great win on, on Saturday evening, Division Four final. It was kind of billed as the the battle across McGlen with the two managers been, been from Cross and former teammates at Club and County, Ushi McConville in, in Wicklow and Tony McEntee in Sligo. But great, like real, real emotional kind of scene a year on from the you know the really sad passing of, of Red Oak Murphy. That was a real emotional scene on Saturday, and you could you could tell how much it meant to the squad and to the people of Sligo to get a national title up in Crow Park and to honour him. Yeah, and I suppose you have to remember these teams, you know, the Sligo's, the Wicklow's, and you know, I was even hoping, you know, when um, Leitrim were in the kind of the last day mix with Andy Moore and being manager that you know that they get to a league final because he's done a massive job down there. You know, that's their big stage. That's their day out. Like, you know, obviously, you know, they'll compete in Connacht, but they know the chance of winning, you know, a Connacht title are, are very slim where the chance of winning a Division 4 and, and moving into Division 3 is their real goal. Um, Yeah, I watched that match. Obviously, the weather didn't help, Um, you know, um, the two goals certainly um, helped Sligo on the day and, you know, they were deserving winners. But I thought it was poignant, especially when Nine Murphy received his man of the match and spoke afterwards. Um. You know that he the way he dressed about Red Oak and you know being a being a, a year on to that day, um, you know was amazing and and you could see um 
many captions on social media afterwards um, speaking about it. So yeah, it's tough on them boys, but you know that's you know that's a win for Sligo Division One Division One title and um, moving up to Division Two last year. Um, you know, and that's their stepping stone. You know, for them the league is everything. Um, you know, and championship whatever they get out of it. While it's a little bit different in, in Connacht this year with Mayo, Galway and Roscommon all being on one side as it was. So the huge chance for Sligo to, to get to a kind of final and, you know, and, and play in the Sam Maguire, you know, it's either going to be possibly them or Leitrim. But yeah, it's a huge chance for one of them teams there to, to kind of compete in that. But, you know, it's, it's probably going to be a, another two or three steps up, you know, from, from uh, obviously a Division 4 title. Luke Towie uh, had some lovely words from uh, about Red Rogue after. I think he was a, he was a Sligo teammate of his, but I think he was also a DCU teammate. He just said, for Red Rogue, Red Rogue and his anniversary being today, I know personally there was massive emotion. That is something you have to contain a small bit when you're playing. But like uh, I've been thinking about him all week, he's constantly on my mind. As a panel going into this final, he was mentioned, he was a focus. I knew Red Rogue, I knew the person he was, and he would have wanted us to go and win that match for the people of Sligo and give it everything. I think we did that. I think the point from that is Red Oak had everything and he should have been out there with us today. He was an unbelievable player with real talent. Uh, I do feel he was with us in some sense and he certainly gave the players uh, a bit of his talent today. That win was for him. He was a friend of mine also who I think of constantly. I know there are some great services out there and if anyone is even fe feeling down or needs help or even just to talk to someone, I really hope that they take advice uh, and do that. Just really, uh, really powerful words there from uh, from his teammate, Luke Towie. Um, I don't know if you, if you saw much of the Division 3 final but uh, just a quick word on uh, Cavan they were obviously beaten in the Talchon Cup final last year by Westmead and Crow Park they were beaten by Fermanagh in the final stages of the of the round robin Division 3 of Division 3 as well but they got revenge comfortable enough 16 points to 1-7 win there's a lot of interesting stories in Ulster this year core isn't there with um, you know you have uh, Conor Laverty and Down you have Fermanagh you know I know they were beaten at the weekend but they've been flying under Kieran Donnelly you have Mickey Graham and Cavan you have Donegal in a bit of disarray you have Derry kind of high flying you have Tyrone trying to bounce back it's a uh, it's a fascinating prospect I know you'd say that Connacht is the best province now based on league rankings with one two and three but Ulster still has a massive amount of intrigue yeah I think Ulster is the one province where you do, you know anyone really on any given day can beat anyone um you're probably not going to see a huge upset in, in Connacht where a Sligo maybe beats a, a Mayo or, or a Galway but you certainly could see a, a, an upset um, in um, the north. I think there's there's so many different um, intriguing battles there. As you said, for Mana, um, probably uh, you know the league form has been great right throughout, and I, I think a little bit disappointed in Crow Park. If I'm honest, against Cavan, Cavan were very comfortable winners, and and probably when you look at Division Three, all you know to start to start the league, were a team that are probably always going to come out on top. Um, but yeah, they have some form now going in, into um, you know to the championship. Yeah, Donegal obviously is a huge worry. We still don't know where they're at. Their their last league out against Roscommon was so poor. But can they uh, you know have a little bit of a bounce back from what's happened? Um, Arma, I suppose the big talking point there is Reno O'Neill and you know how long is he going to be out for? I know McGinley isn't saying it's too long, but you know he's a, he's a huge um, focal point for that team. So it's really wide open. You know, Derry, you know, have been the form team of, of the whole league and um, them and Mayo. And, you know, they were very disappointing yesterday against Dublin um, when it came to it. Um, so, you know, are, are they now a little bit, you know, are they a little bit gone back? And then you have Tyrone, who's been kind of um, very mixed bag in the league, but have um, put a good run of form for the last co couple of league games. So it's, it's, it's difficult, you know, to see who will who, who come out of there. I suppose it's, it's probably Tyrone or Derry that are probably still favourites, but... There's a chase in pack, and as I said, anyone could create a shock on any given day. So, yeah, I I I, I do believe that um, the Ulster Championship is is certainly the most interesting out of them all, where it's um, a lot closer than than most other championships. Corey, you've obviously made the decision in, in recent uh, days to to call time on your AFLW career. Um, I remember chatting to Alan McConnell, who kind of helped to recruit you. Uh, to the to the Giants. Uh, just talk me through. Um, I, I saw various quotes flying around over the weekend. It was something you agreed to do, um, but it wasn't necessarily something that you were 100% sure you were going to do, I'd say, until you were actually out there. No, 100% not. And Anyone that knows me, um, I get asked to do a number of things and I'm always like, yeah, no problem, I'll do it. And I always kind of like, it's in you know, the back of your mind, that's two or three mon months away, that's a long time, but so that was kind of like um, the AFL. I, you know, obviously got a call from him to to well, see was I interested. His son came over, and 
Um, eventually went out for a trial and even at that stage, yeah, I'd said yes, but um, you know, I wasn't used to signing contracts for sport or anything like that. And I was like, yeah, no problem. Uh, you know, I just want to get back home to Ireland. We're in a Connacht club final the week after and you know, we had obviously a run with Karen O'Connor and I suppose I, all my focus was on that. And then, yeah, God, the All-Ireland happened. We won it. And the next thing, oh, 48 hours later, I was meant to be flying to Australia. And even in that time, I was like, God, what am I doing? You know, after winning the club All-Ireland, I should be celebrating. And now I'm like in my head for them two days going, you know, what am I doing? Is there any way I can get out of this? And Were, were you seriously um, thinking of that? Like, like were, you, were you actually seriously thinking about not getting on the plane? Because you're in the middle I, of something where, do you know what I mean? You're in the middle of something where you're just loving life, one of the greatest achievements you've ever achieved. You've signed up to do something and it's completely alien to you as well. You're going into a different world, different sport, different environment, everything. Yeah, I was, I can tell you. The club initially wanted me to fly um, the Sunday night um, after the game to Australia. But, you know, put in context, the, I'd already probably missed six weeks of pre-season at this stage for AFL and probably even a little bit more. It could have been up to eight because um, I was. I told them I wouldn't go over till the club championship was finished. Um, so, um, yeah, um, I told them I wouldn't go over and sure, then... Um, you know, this hep happens and they want me out the night of the All-Ireland final after we won. Um, and then I'm like, no, you can't. Like, you have to celebrate these things. You know, I was captain at the time. Um, and then I suppose 48 hours later, like, oh, Tuesday. And I'm kind of like, oh, is there any chance we can push it to Thursday? Um, and I think at this stage, their uh, their patience is probably wearing a bit thin with me. Um, and I was just like, okay, Tuesday. And I suppose this is all in the lead up to the All-Ireland as well. Like, this is during the week of the All-Ireland, which is probably not the best thing either for me. So... Yeah, I remember being in Dublin Airport waiting to board that flight on the Tuesday evening, um, sitting in a corner on the floor, um, probably severely hung over from, from two days out. Um, not even sure if I had everything put in my bag, packed right. And yeah, that journey, that plane journey, because you have so much time to think in, you know, two flights, you know, 24 hours flying. And yeah, I, I just wasn't in a good way at all, because obviously, as I said, I... Uh, I wasn't in a good mindset um, after two days being out and I had hurt my ribs in that game as well and just everything. I was like, what am I doing? Um, yeah, so I didn't get much sleep on that flight and then arrived out um, um, on that Thursday morning and um, my brother picked me up from the airport. So I went to his house and again, I was just exhausted, obviously, jet lagged and um, yeah, I had a call from um, Al to see how I arrived in and he, that probably arrived in, I think, seven or eight o'clock and he said, oh, one of the girls will pick you up at your brother's house at, at one o'clock for training. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I'd never met this girl. So I had a 40, 40 minute journey to train with this girl that I'd never met. Still slagger now. I'm still very close with her. And she brought me into uh, into the changing rooms and showed me where my locker was and just left me there. Didn't introduce me to anyone. And I'm just sitting there going, oh, my God, um, please, someone come and talk to me. And yeah, eventually they did. And. Yeah, I was, I was doing an interview during the week, the first month of that. Yeah, I really didn't enjoy. It was over Christmas. Um, just find a struggle, obviously, with the training. I was injured. I had a rib injury, as I said, and the heat. It was like 40 degrees summer out there. And, oh, yeah, the first the first kind of, I'd say even six weeks. Then we had a practice match. Um, and then everything kind of changed from there. Played the practice match. Hadn't a clue what I was doing in the practice match. And, just got the ball and I, you know, kicked two two good enough goals on the day. How I kicked them, I don't know. It was definitely pure fluke. And um, I think everyone was like, "Oh wow!" And yeah, things from there just changed automatically. I suppose that helped my confidence, but it also uh, my teammates could kind of could see that I could play a bit as well. And yeah, they could see how hard I was training. So yeah, from there, I suppose I changed because I really enjoyed the game, even though it was manic and not a clue what I was doing. And yeah. Um, yeah, obviously then from there enjoyed it, went and played that season and, and continued to play for, for, for six seasons in total then. Yeah, and I think you ended up as the second highest scorer in the competition's history, in the competition's history. Uh, and obviously the Giants' top scorer of all time. Just going on, the, talking about that first six weeks, I can't imagine what that was like in the sense of you've been going into a Karna Khan dressing room or a Mayo dressing room and always know, like you know everybody. And you know, you know yeah. everybody inside out, and and it's obviously played with you know a round ball, which you've been playing with since you were you know knee high to a grasshopper. Then you're going, you know, the far side of the world to play a game you'd never played before with this funny oval shaped ball with people that you don't know. Like, I don't know, did you come in any way close to to leaving at any stage in that six weeks, or are you just too determined and too dogged and too stubborn? Stubbornness can be a great thing at times. 
Yeah, I, I don't think I ever came close to leaving. I think if um, I, you know, we weren't if we were allowed home for Christmas, um, I'd only be now probably um, three weeks before, before that. So if I had any opportunity to go home for Christmas that time, which I wasn't going to get because we only get a small Christmas break, maybe like seven days, and to fly the other side of the world, that's not that's probably not possible. But if I had a, a, a chance at all to get home, I think I wouldn't have come back. Um, <laughs> But no, I, I suppose it was just everything. Yeah, um, I was used to, as I said, being in setups where I knew everyone. Um, and I'm, you know, in off the field, I'm actually quite a shy person. I wouldn't like be the one that be um, talking to everyone. So I need people to come and talk to me. And then once I get to know them, I'm fine. So, um, and also the Australians for the first while really struggled to understand me. They, they just thought, thought I'd talk, spoke way too fast. Um, <laughs> so I was like, I'd be talking to them, but they couldn't comprehend probably they'd only get me a couple of words of the sentence. Um, so at times they didn't really, not that they didn't want to talk to me, but they just couldn't understand me. So eventually one of them said, we can't understand what you're saying. You're going to have to slow down. And and it was funny, even media after that, like one of the media interviews, like I had to like speak really slowly. Um, and I, I do, even when I'm on to Australians now, I, I know myself, I have to, you know, just slow down. So things like that, um, you know, as I said, training and getting into that level of training, the training was fine physically, physicality wise and all that, but it's just the heat, the heat. Sydney had one of its worst summers and we, we train out west, which means the, the temperatures are even higher. So you could be in the city and it's, you know, 36 degrees. It's always five degrees hot, um, hotter out west. So you're talking about like 40 degree heat probably 95 96 percent humidity and I was like oh, I can't like I'd not want to train in the heat here when it's 20 degrees so all of that like I just used to train and then when I come home from training I wasn't fit to do anything it was just sit down on the couch or go to bed for a couple hours like I'd, I'd say half the time I have a sunstroke or dehydrated and yeah so all it, it did it did cross my mind a few times but nothing major I was just too stubborn and then when I got really interested in really build a relationship with, with the coach or I had his head wrecked. We were out kicking every, you know, every minute of every chance that I could get to, to try and make myself better. And, you know, I built up a great relationship with him and yeah, eventually he just kept him, helped me improve and improve, but it was all the extras. It wasn't anything to do with the four or five days we were training. It was all, you know, the morning sessions or the afternoon sessions I was doing with him. So, um, I really enjoyed that, the challenge of um, trying to get better all the time and, Every session I go, I'd want he'd be teaching me something, and the next session I'd want to have it nailed and 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 you know got good at. So, yeah, I just really enjoyed that part of make my, trying to make myself better. And, and and you know, I suppose in in sport, I probably haven't had that challenge. Where I played rugby for a couple of years, I suppose with Gaelic football, you know, you're you're okay at it. So you just yeah, you know, while you're always trying to improve a little bit, for you know, in AFL, you're you're trying to improve dramatically. The improvements, you know, you see all the time, where you mightn't see them in Gaelic football because you've been playing it for so long. What was the best part of it all, Cora? Even culturally wise, did you have any unbelievable experiences even outside of you know outside of the pitch? Was there anything in particular that stands out? Something that you never would have got to experience if you hadn't if you hadn't made the move? Yeah, I, I, there's loads of things. Obviously, from like I've travelled around Australia, and that's you know just solely from matches. You know, you, you're on an air you're on an airplane every week, if not every second week, travelling. You know, whether you're going to Perth or you're going to. Queensland or Adelaide, wherever, um, you know, we were then in the COVID times, um, we had to hub for a while. So we were eight weeks on the road. So we got to see some amazing parts of Australia. Obviously, we'd quarantine, which certainly wasn't a highlight to two quarantines of 15 days in a hotel. Um, I suppose for me, because I, I always loved sport and the, the aspect of professional sport, um, I was lucky enough the first two years I was over there. Our coach was also at the time involved in the men's programme. So I got to kind of shadow him for a good part of it and go around and follow our men, you know, train with the men. Um, so go into training sessions and just like basically follow the forward group around and sometimes get involved in drills um, and see all the aspect of, you know, these fully professional players that have been playing for a long time. Then I used to travel to matches. Nick Walsh, who got me over there at the start, was also still at the club. He was there for the first two years I was there. He was um, strength and conditioning coach there. So also I got to travel with him to games and I used to get into the coaches' boxes and to get into coaches' boxes and men's games over there is, you know, sacred. You don't get in, um, you know, it's so strict AFL-wise and, you know, they just don't want anyone in. Like, they're just like, it's like a dressing room, it's the inner sanctum. So I yeah, got the opportunity a couple of times to sit in the coaches' men's box, AFL men's box, um, um, and Leon Cameron was the coach at the time. And just to experience um, professional sport at its full height, as in the stress and 
oh, like how coaches behave and react and st how stressful each game. And, you know, because it's their jobs, their careers are on the line, you know, coaching and just how stressed they are in that moment, even when things are going well, like, and just how a coach's box run, you know, there's five, there's five coaches in there between a head coach and assistant coach and, and three line coaches. They're stacked people. It's just, it's just mayhem for probably that two and a half hours they're in there. But just, you know, the way they relay messages, coaches, it's just the way it's done. It's done very old school. They're, they go down on a phone to, to a runner and a runner goes out and gives a message. Just the whole intrigue of a coach's box and the, the insights into a professional sport and the stress of professional sport that it is on that head coach to get everything right week in, week out. Yeah, I just loved it. It was amazing. I was like, I wonder, is this like in, in any other sport? I wonder, is this like NFL or... Um, yeah, so I was just lucky for that kind of first two years that I was there. I got really good experiences um, following the men's team around. And even when I broke my leg, because I rehabbed my leg a lot of the time when the men were in. And, you know, I was off doing, you know, they were you know, just things that you never think. They used to do gymnastics, I think, was every Tuesday or Wednesday. So they go right. over, there's a gymnastics um, center across the road from where we train because we're in the Olympic Park. So all the sports are out there. And they were over like doing gymnastics. And I was like, what's this relevance to the game? But then you see what the relevance is. So I just think the thinking outside the box in, in, in numerous sports, um, I just love that insight. It'd be like spending a, a week, I suppose, with like Manchester United or something like that. The insights you get are just amazing. That's fascinating. I'd imagine, um, I'd imagine you have a taste to go into coaching or management at some stage in the not too, not too distant future. Yeah, well, I suppose I'm in with Galway Camogie helping out at the moment. And, you know, um, while my title is a performance coach, I'm not, not really comfortable with that title. Um, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of jack of all trades, to be honest, when I go in. Um, you know, I, I'm doing a little bit of coaching with our forward line at the moment, which I really enjoy. Um, I, you know, I've never played Camogie, but the principles of all sports are nearly exactly the same. So, yeah, working a good bit with our forward line and I'm bringing stuff, obviously, from AFL across that I've learned coaching-wise and, and obviously from Gaelic football. Um, and then, you know, I'm working with the girls, you know, individually, one on one to try and maximize the performance collectively, um, you know, kind of helping our um, manager, Carl Murray, you know, you know, deal with players, um, you know, individually, one on one, if there's any issue. So I'm really like I went in first going, oh, God, I'm not sure, Carl, if this is for me when I went in in January. Um, and even the first kind of couple of weeks, you know, I didn't know any of them trying to get to know them and all that. But yeah, in the last kind of month or so, since games really start kicking in, I'm really enjoying it. Um, you know, just the things you learn um, from, you know, individual players and from 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 females playing the game um, is just intriguing um, and trying to, you know, find solutions to different things, whether it's, you know, player low on confidence, self-esteem, um, trying to identify which player, you know, sometimes needs his arm around the shoulder, but another you know, other, other player could be motivated by, um, you know, probably wouldn't say giving out to them, but like by telling them that they could do things better. Um, so it's, mm. I'm intrigued by learning how to, how we, how we, each individual is um, motivated, um, and I'm getting there. Um, yeah, and I'm just really enjoying the setup, and and even the coaching parts. Which, you know, we've we've three coaches there, and even watching them go, you're learning so much from them. So I love picking up nuggets, and you know that you can bring in. Um, so yeah, I'm enjoying that. So yeah, so probably down the line, I'll have aspirations to to do that but I suppose I need, I need to do a little bit of an apprentice first and, and, and learn a bit more Just the last one Cora there's, I think there's a good 30 Irish uh, women scheduled to play AFLW next year I think um, one of the Mackins from, from Armagh was one of the most recent names is there I don't is this cutting across the LGFA a lot now where you know you're looking at the the guts of 30 players do the LGFA need to maybe look at structuring their season a little bit different or what do you think is, is it at is like is it at a point of you know serious worry for the LGFA uh I wouldn't say serious worry but I, I'd say it's getting there now I've read a couple of things again on social media and I think Morris Brosnan had something you know oh you know a lot of these girls didn't play beforehand Dana Finn going out you know he said Aileen Gilroy um, and that there's a lot of girls, you know, doing both at the moment. Yeah, and I take his point. There is a lot of girls that are, you know, playing with their county and and going back over across. But that's only sustainable for a certain length of time. They're normally girls that are probably only a year or two, you know, are have only decided to go out and then go out. Um, but you see girls you know, um, that go out and see that the, you know, they really like the sport and want to get better of it. And their only way of getting better at it is by staying over there. Um, you know, and we've seen that the likes of um, Neve Kelly, Grace Kelly, uh, Sarah Rowe, Anya Tighe, 
um, Orlo Dwyer, um, you know, there, um, there are only a few, I could name more. They've all decided not to come back and play in County Ash Mac um, in West Coast. So they're, 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 that's, you know, six or seven that I've named. Um, and then there's girls, you know, they've come home and played a bit. Vicky Wall went out and done her preseason a little bit earlier and is now back. That can't happen. That can be happen probably for the next, you know, season or two, maybe three. But the season every every year there is going to get longer. You know, the the players' association there are pushing that AFL women's will be fully professional by 2030, if not earlier. Um, so that means it'll be a full on competition like the men. Um, so they'll play the men play I think 22 or 23 rounds at the moment and four four or five weeks of finals. So they could play up to 27 games and they get yeah. a couple of months off. So that's the way eventually it's going to go. Um, clubs will demand more of players because they're contracted with them. Um, some clubs, you know, and I think Sinead Goldrick's probably the biggest, highest profile that didn't come back and play for Dublin this year. Clubs demand more of them and, and want them to stay. If you all have an injury, they'll expect you to stay over. Um, you know, they might let you home for a two-week holiday. So it, it is going to be a problem. It is draining ladies' football. I know you have the likes of the Mackin saying they'll play with Armagh, Ash Maloney, um, Anna Rose Kennedy, all of these. Yeah, that's their first year. But in three years' time, will they still be playing with Armagh and Tipperary? You know, un- unless they've, they've left AFL, they probably won't. So I do think it's going to be a huge drain. And I think it's something the ladies' football need to look at now um, from the point of view, what's going to happen later? Because I can tell you, um, every day I have a message from someone asking me how they can get out, whether th- that girl could be 17, she could be 22, she could be 24. Um, there's a huge demand from players, they see it, that they want to go out there now. So um, if that's the case, I know the AFL are going to come hard as well, and they're coming hard already, and they want more and more out there. So, yeah, it's a worry for me because if you look um, even in the, maybe, say, next year or the year after, you don't have Vicky Wall, Ashley, Ashley Maloney, Amy Mackin, Eve McLaughlin playing, you know, they're all former players of the year um, and they're only four. Um, is the championship or is ladies football worse off because you don't have your uh, star players playing? I think it is. I think the product won't be as good as it could be with them in it. So um, I had a conversation with Tom Parsons around this yesterday uh, and I think it's, yeah, it's, it's it, to me, the only answer is integration, getting, you know, all the, all the bodies under one, you know, I've spoken about this enough times and, um, as Tom said to me yesterday, getting um, a Division One ladies final on before Mayo and, and um, Mayo and, and Galway yesterday, get the ladies final on before it, or you know whatever it might be. You know, at once in, you have in the news that you have all these girls going on into Australia, and at the same time you've Cav- Cavan ladies who um, yeah. you know, are on strike because because they're not receiving. I think they wanted thirty euro carriage already down from Dublin. Oh, it's so, so basic, Cora. It's the most it's so, basic. It's so of basic, basic for like. Why would you? Why would you expect it, girl? Why would you stay around for that when you're not, you know, you're not yeah. being looked after? And and it's not even looked after. They're simple things. Whether you're looking for a couple of euro expenses because you're a student and you're in college and you can't afford to come down, or whether you're looking for good facilities or whatever it might be, and you you go to Australia, you have all them on hand every day of the week. The the resources over there are amazing facilities, um, and then you're getting paid in the top. Of it. But also you're you're young and, and free and you're 22 and 23 and you're the other side of the world in, in beautiful weather. So, mm. yeah, I, I, it's, it is a worry for me. I know people are saying, oh, you know, that some of these girls haven't played and, and this and that. But, you know, I, I spoke about this probably four or five years ago. The, the numbers were, were probably at about 50 now and higher if COVID didn't strike for two years because in them two years, Irish couldn't get out. They couldn't recruit any Irish. So that stopped the numbers increasing. That numbers would be a lot higher now only for COVID. So it is a worry for me. I think ladies football need to look at something dramatically, quickly, and see can they, they try and stop it in, in, in some regards. But um, it's it's probably, it's going to be a hard thing, but it's something that they, they need to look at. And as I said, I know um, coming into the future, the AFL are, are you know, I, I've talked to the head of the AFL, the women's, Nicole Livingston, and they love their Irish players out there and they want to see more and more of them come. Yeah, brilliant, Cora. Thanks a million for your time. Just a quick a comment in there from a viewer, the Shell Minetti. Just a great interview. Cora is as hard as a diamond. I think we all uh, echo that st- sentiment. I don't. I don't. You probably will. Uh, will pass it off and brush it away as modesty. But uh, thanks a million for your time and congratulations on a, an unbelievable playing career. Uh, down down under you. You set the tone for for all the ladies that have, that have followed. Uh, well done, and no doubt we'll talk again. Thanks, a million, Michael. Take care. Thanks, Cora. Thanks a million. So that was brilliant. Great to have uh, Cora Staunton there, uh, Mayo football legend, AFLW legend as well. That's all we have uh, 
for time for on today's show. Thanks a million for joining us. We will be back on Thursday. We will have Eddie Brennan and Niall Morn teeing up the Division 1 National Hurling League final between Limerick and Tipperary. And we will chat to you on Thursday, folks. Thanks a million.